our scripture reading this morning is found in uh, 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 and 23. 1 Samuel 15, verses 22 and 23. Shout Amen when you found it. And it says, But Samuel replied, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Pastor, please. Once again, happy Sabbath, everybody. Shall we pray? Father God, our desire this morning is that you will bless us as we study your word. All praise and honor go to you. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. The last time I stood before you, we talked about King Saul and how he did not follow the counsel of the Lord to trust and to obey him. For there is no true way to be successful unless we learn to trust and obey God. What do you say, everybody? Saul was told to wait seven days before engaging in battle with the Philistines. He did not follow God's instructions and therefore consequences, bad consequences resulted. There will always be consequences, bad ones, when there is disobedience to the will of God. Saul saw his army evaporating like water. He put on the priestly robe, which he had no right to do. And then he tried to do something that was not his prerogative, make a sacrificial offering. Now, what I would like for us to do is to continue our story. We're going to pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 10 through 12. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Samuel chapter 13, and we're going to begin with verse 10 and go to verse 12. The record says, Now it happened. As soon as he had finished, presenting the burnt offering that Samuel came and Saul went out to meet him that he might greet him. And Samuel said, what have you done? Saul said, when I saw the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Mixmus, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal, and I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore, I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. Now, brothers and sisters, as I stated earlier, it was not the king's responsibility to make burnt offerings. Whose responsibility was it? It was the priest's responsibility. So Samuel responds in verses 13 and 14. He says to Saul, you have done foolishly, or as some would put it, Saul, you have played the fool. Samuel continues, you have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you, for now the Lord would have 
establish your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you, Saul, have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Samuel's statement to Saul should put all of us on God that there is no one, brothers and sisters, absolutely no one who is irreplaceable. I first realized this as a teenager. I was about 16 years of age. I was in high school. And on November the 22nd, 1963, the day that America lost its innocence, our president, John F. Kennedy, was assassinated in Dallas. And I remember when they made the announcement over the loudspeaker that our president had been shot, I began to think, well, what's going to happen now? A little bit later, they said over the loudspeaker that President Kennedy had died from a bullet wound to the head. And I said to myself, well, what's going to happen now? Our president is dead. I had no idea who the vice president of the United States was. Because Kennedy was so charismatic. But ladies and gentlemen, within 30 minutes after the death of JFK, Lyndon B. Johnson was sworn in as the 36th president of the United States. No one is indispensable. There is no person so powerful that he or she cannot be removed. After Samuel rebuked Saul and left him at Gilgal, Israel defeated the Philistines. However, it was not because of Saul's military genius. It was because of the faith of Saul's son, whose name was Jonathan. Jonathan took his armor bearer on a secret raid of the enemy camp. And this is what he said to his armor bearer in 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 6. He said, come, let us cross over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. Perhaps the Lord will work for us. For the Lord is not restrained to save by many or by few. While Jonathan and his armor bearer killed several who were in the Philistine camp, we are told that God caused an earthquake under the Philistines' camp. And that sent them into a panic. This caused the invaders to flee back home and to run as fast as they could with the Israelites in pursuit. However, before Jonathan had saved the day for Israel, Saul had issued a very rash and foolish order, which nearly cost Israel the victory that day. Let's look at verses 24 through 26. We're still in 1 Samuel 14. The Bible says, And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. Verse 25. Now all the people of the land came to a forest, and there was honey on the ground. And when the people had come into the woods, there was honey dripping, but no one put his hand to his mouth. 
for the people feared the oath. The oath that Saul had told them, don't eat anything because we're going to be fasting this whole day. Now, brothers and sisters, from a reasonable standpoint, no one can figure out why in the world Saul would make such a ridiculous vow. But when someone is on the downward trend as Saul was becoming more and more, when the slope of their life is losing the grip on reality, he or she will often make decisions that are foolish, irrational, and occasionally dangerous. Saul obviously didn't care about his men as much as he cared about his own reputation and his own pride. The mere fact that men who are in battle are not allowed to eat, they will become weak and not have the strength they need to fight a good fight. But that didn't faze Saul. The only thing Saul cared about was numbers. He did not care about his soldiers. Even in his even his own son. What was his son's name again, everybody? Even his own son could see that his father had made a big mistake. Let's look at verses 27 through 30. Here we read, But Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with the oath. Therefore, he, Jonathan, stretched out the end of the rod that was in his hand and dipped it in a honeycomb and put his hand to his mouth, and his countenance brightened. Then one of the people said, Jonathan, your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. But Jonathan said, My father has troubled the land. Look now how my countenance has brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much better if the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found, for now would there not have been a much greater slaughter among the Philistines. In other words, brothers and sisters, Jonathan was saying, what an honor decision, what an unwise vow my father has made. Why would he say such a thing or make such a command? Look, I'm an example, Jonathan says. If we were going to be cursed, then God would have killed me, but I'm still alive. But to the contrary of what my father has said and done, I am strengthened this day because I have eaten food to be able to fight the enemy. Jonathan <clears throat> was the voice of reason on that day. Clearly, <clears throat> Saul has started to lose it mentally. When Saul heard what Jonathan had done, he said in verse 44, <clears throat> Jonathan, you will surely die. Saul is losing his marbles. Try to imagine Saul's insanity. Rather than admit that his order was impulsive and idiotic and repent to God for his foolishness, he was about to execute his own son to save face. Fortunately, his subjects intervened with some common sense. Verse 45, but the people said to Saul, must Jonathan die? Who has brought about this great deliverance in Israel? Far from it. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, and he did not die. The people stood up to Saul. And so finally back down. Church, let this scene soak in for a moment. So determined to preserve his own image, 
Saul was willing to take the life of his son to avoid retracting a foolish decision. But God, being the God that he is, and he's a good God, can somebody say amen? God, being the God that he is, would give Saul another chance. It's amazing how God keeps giving us opportunity after opportunity, and he's giving us one chance after another, we let him down, and he keeps giving us chance after chance after chance. I believe that there is no one in the universe like our God. So God decides to give Saul a final test. He's going to give Saul just one more chance. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he ambushed him on the way when he, when he came up from Egypt. Now go and attack Amalek and de utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Is that clear? I mean, this was what God told Saul to do. It's very clear to me, brothers and sisters. God said, utterly destroy all that he has. Everything in the enemy camp is cursed, including the people who have rejected the word of me, the creator of the universe. They have rejected me for hundreds and hundreds of years, and the whole place is a curse. So I want you to wipe everything out. Now, let's not forget, brothers and sisters, this is the Lord who issued this order. And the God that we serve will eventually bring all of us into judgment. As Solomon said, whether our deeds have been good or evil, whether they have been secret or open, all of us will have to face the judgment seat of God someday, and we will have to answer for everything we have done in this world. So, Saul was given his orders with, with absolute clarity, straight from God. Kill everything and everyone, period. But then we read in the first part of verse 8. He, Saul, took Agag, king of the Amalekites, he took him alive. Saul, are you deaf? Did you not understand what I said, Saul? Is your hearing going out on you? But then, brothers and sisters, it gets even worse. Verse 9. Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. But everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. Whew. Again, did Saul misunderstand? Who gave Saul the right to decide what was good and what was worthless? What to save and what to destroy? His soldiers were to leave only corpses on the land in obedience to God. But they didn't. Now verses 10 and 11. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned his back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. The next day, Samuel goes to meet Saul 
or rather, yeah, Samuel goes to meet Saul, and <laughs> this is what Saul says to him in verse 3, or rather verse 13. Saul says, blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. If it wasn't so ridiculous, it would be humorous, brothers and sisters. He said, look, Samuel, I, I, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. You've done what, Saul? It was a blatant lie. Samuel's response to Saul is priceless. Verse 14. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Now, ladies and gentlemen, verses 16 through 21 summarizes in capsule form everything that happened from the time that Saul was set up as the first king of Israel up to this point. And so therefore, it's important for us to look at these six verses because they are very, very critical to everything that's going to happen afterwards. The Bible says, starting with verse 16, Then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet, and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak on. So Samuel said, When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites and fight against them until they are consumed. When then, why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do not eat and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought me back Agag and Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Now this is how Saul tried to get out of it. Verse 21. But the people, did you all get that? But the people took the plunder, sheep and oxen, the beast of the thing, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Now, he shifts the blame from himself to the people. Brothers and sisters, you have to give Saul credit, though. <laughs> yeah, you, you got to give him credit because Saul knew how to rationalize. He not only puts the blame on the people, he also claimed that the schools were preserved for sacrifice. I mean, after all, isn't that what God wants? Doesn't God want sacrifice? So he says, look, we saved the sheep and we saved some of the other animals so that we could make a sacrifice to the Lord. Wasn't that nice of me? This too was a symptom of how Saul's mind had become so twisted. He had lost all sense of the gravity of his situation. The importance of his position as a leader among God's people. He had lost the significance of obedience and most of all, the immensity and the goodness of the God whom he served, who kept giving him chance after chance after chance. I see a lesson, a very important lesson here, brothers and sisters. When we start to rationalize behavior, bad behavior, we too can lose sight of what's right and wrong. Because sooner or later, right will seem like wrong and wrong will seem like right. Anybody remember a fellow by the name of Judas? Yeah. Judas rationalized his behavior when he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Anybody remember a couple by the name of Ananias and Sapphira? 
they <clears throat> rationalized they, their behavior when they broke a promise that they had made to support the church. Saul's convoluted sense of right and wrong actually had him thinking that he was doing right. Self-delusion writes its own tragic ending. Samuel's next words are very familiar to all of us. They cut to the heart of the matter and may even preserve our lives <clears throat> if we find ourselves wanting to rationalize something that God has made very clear to us. Look what he says, verses 22 and 23. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices <clears throat> as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Verse 23. For rebellion is at is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Samuel was no longer trying to save Saul's crown. That was already lost. The old prophet was trying to do for Saul what he could not do for his own sons. Save him from further rebellion and inevitable self-destruction. Unfortunately, no matter what God had tried to do to save Saul, no matter what Samuel tried to do to save Saul, they couldn't. The man whose epitaph was, I have played the fool. Saul, brothers and sisters, did not start out that way. He was once, as we said in, our, in the first part of our sermon a month or so ago, Saul was once a tall, handsome, modest, modest I should say, gener generous, valiant warrior, and a humble servant of God. But because he refused to bow to obedience to God, his heart became hardened. He became greater in his own eyes than in the eyes of God. If we, like Saul, have attempted to rationalize wrong, and I guess I would call this the meat of our message today, if we have attempted to rationalize wrong, and the devil is always there to try to make us do it, let's make up our mind today to turn back from any road that God does not want us to go down. If we have done wrong, and we know in the sight of God this is not his will, let us admit our error. Let's seek the Lord's mercy. What do you say? Amen. Let's bow humbly before our God. Let's put an end to our rebellion and rationalization. Let's say like the Apostle Paul did, I have determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And we will find that God is quick to hear He's willing to forgive, and he will overflow us with mercy and grace. That's the God that I serve. And I want to get to the place where I will no longer rationalize and make excuses for not doing his will. Where thou leadest, I will go. That's my prayer. What about you? Amen.